On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Opal. And Opal was in a toxic relationship with a grandiose narcissist. It's a story of push-pulls, enmeshed personal and business lives, the fear of failure, and putting your self-worth into someone else's hands. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. This is a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of toxic relationships. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. Now, if you have not been to our website recently and want to be a guest on our show, please go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. Click on that button, and away we will go from there. And we are also accumulating, I can never say that property, accum- <laughs> I'm not going to even try. Uh, we are, I'll try. We are accumulating, How? Do, what's wrong with me today? Anyway, <laughs> We're, we're collecting these letters for our Letters to My Narcissist compilation episode. And you can also go to NarcissistApocalypse.com to... I have no idea what I'm even saying anymore. Let me just start back from the beginning. Another way to be part of the show is to... <laughs> I'm acting weird today. It, Another way to be part of our show is to go to NarcissistApocalypse.com and be part of our Letters to My Narcissist compilation episode. So if you want a re- to read a letter to your narcissist, go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Side of the page, there is a button that says send voicemail. Click click that button. Records up to five minutes. Click it twice. Records up to ten. We are accumulating these <laughs> letters for a volume six of that episode. And if you do not want to read the letter yourself and you want me or my old pal, Melissa, to read the letter for you, just please send it to NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com and put letters to my narcissist in the subject line. And everyone, if you want to support our show, we have a Patreon and our Patreon is where we have extra episodes that never made it to air, follow-up episodes with former guests. We also have on there virtual support groups through Zoom every Wednesday and Saturday night. We also have our own support forum page. And we are releasing content on there every week, every two weeks. And if you want to help support the show, please do come be please do become a patron of our Patreon at patreon.com slash narcissist apocalypse. And about the Patreon, in about a month's time, uh, we were going to be switching from our Patreon over to another platform, and we will be creating our own social network, and it'll be a community-based network, and it is beautiful looking. We're working on it right now. It's going to be really immersive, and we're going to be on there uh, supporting each other, helping each other out. Uh, we're still building it out a little, and you won't just be able to connect with people through, you know, the, your shared trauma. We're we're all going to be making friends on there, and you'll be able to find people through other types of subjects that you'll like. It's coming along really nicely, and you know, I'll keep you up to date of what's going on. But September first, we're going to be moving everything. It's going to be a brand new world, and I hope everyone comes to join us uh, at that time. So just kind of putting it out there for everyone. And I also want to say that uh, you know. We're also, you know, working on a shoestring budget to put this show together. So we started to do um, sponsorships for our show, and people have been sponsoring because we have support services, 
and you know we're growing and it's all coming out of my pocket so it's becoming more difficult as time goes on so thank you uh, so much to the people that have donated uh, to the show so far and if you want to consider donating to the cause to help grow our support services to also to reach a larger audience and help more people sponsoring an episode of this podcast is a big way to make a big difference uh, for so many people you know you're going to help thousands and thousands of people so thank you so much much for considering it, thinking about it, and for the people that have. And this week's episode was sponsored by Ryan. And I just want to say a big thank you to Ryan for for doing this. And, you know, I'm uh, forever grateful. Everyone is your generosity um, and knows no bounds. So thank you so much for me and everyone listening. You helped change so many people's lives. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you want to support our show and be a sponsor of our show, like Ryan did this week, like JJ did last week, and like Fern did the week before that, please do email me at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com and we'll discuss everything and go from there. And before we begin this episode with Opal... I just want to kind of talk about this episode because it was a really interesting episode, not just for uh, Opal to tell her story, but it was also interesting uh, for me as well. And I say that because, you know, this episode and what we do here, what I do, for the most part, everyone else does a lot of the heavy lifting. I'm just listening. And, you know, when it comes to telling stories, it's not easy for someone to come onto this podcast and tell their story. It's, you know, it might sound easy. Some people might even be critical of the people that have told their stories, but it's not something that is easy to do. And people are telling their stories sometimes for the very first time. And, you know, I'm also uh, guilty sometimes. Sometimes I do kind of get frustrated here or there when we're trying to do recordings and things aren't going well. And sometimes I even show a a, a lack of of patience and it makes me have to be better. Um, And this was uh, an episode this week where I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my my shortcomings uh, as well. And, you know, Opal came here. Uh, to be on this show and she told me beforehand you know that there's going to be some coaxing that was kind of needed and we went through I think about 45 minutes and things just weren't working and it was hard for me to kind of put my finger on what was going on And, you know, we scrapped, we started from scratch after we recorded the first 45 minutes. We started pretty much right at the beginning again. We might have kept like 10 minutes in from the beginning, but we started brand new and, you know, eventually we got onto a groove and it took a while to get there. And uh, Opal was patient with me. And I want to thank Opal for being patient with, you know, my craziness over here. And I learned a lot. And I think this is a really interesting episode. Uh, It was, I'm in there a bit more. Um, We discover a lot. And it's more of a back and forth compared to most episodes. And I really want to thank Opal. You know, you'll hear me say later that, Opal brought the best, I I felt she brought the best out of me. And, you know, sometimes I guess when I'm doing this, I I can get lazy. And sometimes I'm, depending on the hour of the day, I might be tired when uh, doing uh, a recording because sometimes I do a lot of stuff during the day. And, you know, so I just really want to thank Opal and uh, that's pretty much it. So everyone, this is one of my favorite episodes, you know, mainly because I think Opal grew a little bit during it. I did as well. And I really hope you in, in, enjoy this and you hope the you enjoyed the backstory of how we got here. So uh, f- uh, from Opal, thank you. And me, thank you. Everyone who's listening, thank you for listening. And now without further ado, here is my episode with Opal. 
Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, I have Opal. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Brandon? I am doing well, and we chatted for a little bit. We got to know each other a little. I'm happy you are here with me today. It's unfortunate that you are here with me today, and today you are going to tell us the story of your first relationship with a narcissist. You had two, and we're going to hear the first one. Obviously, there's a point of this relationship, obviously, I say, there's a point in this relationship where you eventually do have a relationship with someone else, and then you go back to your partner. But just so it's not confusing for everyone, that we kind of get it out of the way, just in case at first. And, you know, you dealt with a lot of psychological and emotional abuse, and you're still here with us today. You're going to tell your story. You're going to help a lot of people. And I'm thanking you for being here. And now, without further ado, Opal, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much for the chance to be here and to share my story as so many of the stories that I've been listening to from other people um, have helped me along the way so much. So even though it's not very easy to be the teller, um, I feel like I want to try to to pitch my story into the pile so that hopefully it could help somebody else. Um, my, um, my story really starts, I think, from my childhood, as most of us probably know by now, um, our personalities form early, and there are things that I look back on now from my younger years that definitely set me on a path that eventually attracted uh, my first and then second narcissistic relationship into my life. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about that recently, um, and I should say that my relationships, plural, with these these two people um, took place over the course of about five years. Um, an, a first relationship, then a, a second with a new narcissist, and then another relationship with the original. And so there were a lot of years there where I struggled to find meaning. And so in the time since my no contact with my narcissist, which I'm happy to say is now in the 280 something days of no contact I've had a lot of time to think about things and I want to try to share some of those thoughts my childhood was was really um, quiet it was in a very sleepy little town and I was able to explore myself creatively I'm a I'm a creative person professionally now as an adult but I was as a child as well I was very um, introspective and thoughtful, bookish. I read all the time, maybe a little bit of a um, introvert. And I remember from the beginning really wanting to be a part of things, uh, wanting to be uh, part of the group at, of kids at school, really wanting to be liked by the other kids and ideally have a place. Um, and I remember noticing really early on uh, wh whether or not someone wanted to sit next to me on the bus was really important. I would have, you know, a couple of kids that I really wanted to be friends with. And I remember really worrying about whether I would be liked enough at school to be their friends. And there was some, you know, false starts there. I remember there were girls that didn't like me and, and would pick on me and I would sort of feel really small. And I think as early as that in my life anyway, I started to see those things happening as being a, a sign of, of flaws in myself, not that someone else was acting in the way that they wanted to and couldn't help doing, but just that it was a sign that I wasn't really the way I wanted it to be, and I would try harder. Um, and that really continued, I think, for most of my childhood. I was um, always working extra hard to be extra perfect, I think is a good way to say it, and um, tried really hard to be helpful to my family. To I was the oldest of two children, 
So um, I think I grew up quickly in wanting to be a serious older child that was always listening to the things my parents would be saying and whatever they worried about and thinking, how can I be helpful? How can I solve that problem for them even though I was little? And I don't think they knew that I was thinking those things. (laughs) But still, I think that's the stuff that was running through my head from a young age. And the other thing that I have remembered since uh, recently looking back on my childhood is that uh, my really close relationship with my grandfather was um, a really formative experience for me. And I would sit and listen for hours on end to stories about his his uh, great uh, escapades and his amazing um, adventures. And he had such a um, idealized, romantic view of his life. He told stories with reverence about things that had happened to him and places he had been and things he had accomplished. And it was a little more grandiose than the real version of that, probably happened, but it was painted in such a beautiful way that it fit with my fairy tale way of thinking that I was building in my mind, and I would love listening to these tales, and in retrospect, I now look back and I say to myself, those were the first times that I learned the language of uh, idealizing someone um, from the, in their own words, they, he was self-idealizing he was creating a fantasy version of his of his past and he was telling me because I was a captive audience and I would just lap it up and I would be desperate to be the most perfect granddaughter I could be and as a result I was the golden child I was the favorite of there was probably 20 of us um, grandchildren and I had that special place because I was always the one who would listen and I would absorb everything he said and hang on every word. So looking back, I think those things really had significance when I think about my adult relationships with narcissists. Um, It's amazing how even loving people who don't um, abuse you in ways that other people might recognize are unwittingly perhaps planting seeds for things that can grow into bigger problems down the road. And certainly I think that's what happened for me. So when it comes to your whole childhood up to, let's say 18 years old, you're a bit of, you become a bit of a perfectionist. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And you struggle with being good enough. So you also become a people pleaser. And I guess with, besides being a people pleaser, um, you have this, I guess, uh, idea of what maybe relationships should be or a belief system of what life should be like or what you want out of things. And, and, you know, in the notes that you sent me, you use the word Disney. And, uh, you know, as a model for a lot of kids growing up, there are these Disney vacations, if that is that a word, did I say it properly, Uh, of of life and of what is to be uh, expected of relationship in these uh, you know, and eventually see them in romantic comedies uh, a, a lot where, you know, you're supposed to forgive like these people and these romantic comedies, even though these horrible things happened. A lot of them where you're duped and in Disney, you're, you're romanticizing this fantasy of uh, life and what a relationship and a prince charming and all these types of things. So does, is that playing another kind of role as far as the influences of this fantasy world? Is that make sense? Am I off a little here or no? Absolutely. That's exactly it. My, um, my cultural upbringing as, um, you know, part of the Western world, I think probably is one of similarities to many, especially us girls growing up where we do get so many over-idealized images. 
And in my own family, uh, beyond the Disney princesses I saw on television, I heard um, f- supposedly firsthand accounts of the fairy tale being real for my grandparents, according to my grandfather. Now, if you you know had asked his adult children to tell you how did that marriage really go, they wouldn't have painted the picture quite the way that my grandfather liked to tell the story. But he he absolutely. In his later years, was it was really important to him to um, share the legend of his life, literally the legend of it, and that really felt like fact to me at the time. And he would always end the story with, "I hope you're lucky enough to live a life like mine." And so I think I set about trying not to screw it up. Get everything perfect so that you can live a legendary life too. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's that's a big setup. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself, <laughs> and then I'm going to assume a lot of shame as far as when things aren't going well because y- you've given yourself an impossible thing to live up to. Exactly. Um, you think this is confirmation that there's still something wrong with me. That's the same something wrong with me that made that girl not want to sit next to me on the bus. It, it must be that even though everybody else knows how to do this perfectly, I uh, there's something wrong with me. So I guess so, that, yeah. Yeah, that, that leads us into, you know, you meeting this uh, first person and, you know, I guess before you met him, what were your relationships like before? Did you have any relationships before? And uh, I, you know, quickly, like how did, how did they go? Yeah. Uh, So I did have lots of relationships um, and they were generally longer term relationships for my age. So throughout, you know, middle school, high school, college, I was more often in a relationship than not, and they generally tended to be at least nine months, a year and a half, sometimes a few years. I was always romantic going in, and uh, I was also really attentive. And so as long as I kept meeting um, people who were uh, fairly nice to me and available I poured myself into it, and I probably made a great girlfriend. I was really attentive and always, you know, trying to make them feel special because that's my go-to thing to connect with somebody. I want to make them feel good, and that's that's you know a part of of um, what made me also such an attractive candidate eventually to the narcissist that came down the pike. But when I met that person, I had already a basis of of lots of normal relationships. Um, before that point. So where did you meet this person for the first time? So I meet my narc at, for the first time at work. I've just taken an incredible design job. It's the job of my dreams. I'm in a city working for a designer I respect so much, and I'm working at this firm, and he's hired, and he's a fellow designer. Um, he's... The most exotic, um, foreign, wonderful accent, well-dressed, very unusual person at this design firm. Everybody notices him. He's the star. He, um, he, He has the highest number of clients. He's the most successful, and he's working relentlessly. He's a tiger at his job. And, um, and I am just... Maybe number two. I'm I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, he's he's amazing. He's ten years older. He's been all over the place. He knows all of things that I wish I knew about being a, an amazing designer. And so I have a lot of professional respect for him, but we really don't have a lot of personal contact. He he kind of maintains his distance. I do my thing. He does his. Um and it. It isn't actually until I leave this firm to take um, the chance to move out of state with my with my husband. I'm married at this time, and um, start a new life and and launch my own design firm. And that's actually the moment when our previous professional relationship rekindles, and he starts getting back in touch. So um, 
I am working hard starting this design firm out of, you know, from nowhere, from nothing, in a spare bedroom. I'm starting this business just all by myself. And, um, we, you know, I get text messages from him. How are you doing? What's going on? How's everything going? He's really curious. He wants to hear. And I tell him how's it, how it's going. I'm flattered that he's staying in touch. To, to me, it, it feels like, why does he, why is he even paying attention to me? I'm out of state. I was, you know, just a lowly, you know, he never noticed me much before. Why is he in touch now? But he was curious. He was surprisingly curious about what was going on. And I would tell him, and I would tell him about the ups and the downs. And as I go along and I'm building this new business, I'm actually starting to see it work. And I'm getting busy. Clients are coming in. I'm All of a sudden, I can't figure out how to keep up. I've got more clients than I know what to do with. I'm tearing my hair out some days. I think, oh my gosh, I'm getting buried. I don't think I can keep up all by myself. What am I going to do? And so, you know, he hears some of this from his, you know, texts back and forth with me. And his, I can tell that I have his attention and he's, he's ready and waiting and ready to help. He wants to work part time. He wants to, you know, spend time on nights and weekends. I can help you out. I can, I can work, you know, I can moonlight with you while I still have my job here. It'll be great. You're so talented, he says to me. You're so wonderful. You're going to be amazing, but I just don't think that you have enough hours in the day. You're going to need, you know, you're going to need me. And so I just, I latch onto this. I'm thinking this is great. I, I don't know where this is headed yet, but this company seems to be taking off. It would be great if I had your expertise. You're so much more um, advanced and in years in the career that, than I, that I am, and I'm, I'm looking up to him still, so I'm thinking, how lucky am I that he he's offered this to me? He's going to work, you know, alongside me to make this happen. So here's a moment where you are struggling. He comes in kind of as a savior to you. Oh, You're taking all of that in. You know, you don't want to fail at all, so you know to bring him in this way. And you bring him in because he's also flattering you, and he's stroking your ego in a lot of ways, and he's building you up at the same time. So, yep. you know, that's kind of going on. So he's able to wrangle himself back in, into your life. And, you know, while this is going on, you know, from, from our notes that we had before, uh, you know, as things are going well for you, things aren't going well for your husband who has moved and he's fallen into a depression of sorts. And it's something you have a, a difficult time with because you don't understand it. And you guys uh, start, your marriage starts to get a little bit rocky here. So can you explain, you know, how your marriage gets a little bit rocky and then at the same time, how uh, this, uh, abuser that has come into your life starts feeding that a little bit more and uh, what kind of love bombing as well and trust building is going on at the same time while all that is happening because you know there's a triangulation kind of going on here and it's like an unhealthy situation for for you uh, you know your husband doesn't know that the sky's like barking in your ear and it's affecting everything. So can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I think he had met my husband, I think, once, maybe twice in, in very brief situations before we had moved away. So at least he knew him enough to, to kind of get a five-second take on him. And um, I don't think he ever missed an opportunity to – remind me that he didn't have a very high opinion of, of my husband. And when I started to share with him little by little, that I was really struggling in my marriage. Um, my husband was really struggling. He had a lot of problems with depression, um, alcohol abuse, things like that, that made his life uh, really difficult. And and so he would always jump in. My narc would say, well, it's not because of, you know, any of those things. It's really just he was the wrong guy for you. He was, he's not me. I'm the one who understands your your greatness. 
he's um, seeing me, he's describing me as this talented designer. And, and I'm just like, I didn't even really know you thought that of me. Um, you always treated me like it didn't matter what, I, I didn't realize you had so much respect for me and you thought I was so special. And he would say, oh yes, you're, you're so um, talented. You're the most talented designer that I've met in the, in the States. And um, he's just not the, he's not the right guy for you. He, he doesn't understand you the way I do. So he was kind of trying to insert himself in the cracks of the marriage. And, um, and at that point, it was a really vulnerable marriage. And I was feeling like, oh my gosh, my, my professional life is soaring. My personal life is falling apart. And here's, here's the person who says he's the answer to all of those problems in one package. It was obviously a little too good to be true. So, um, so he would say things like, um, someday, uh, when, you know, when we're not married to the wrong people, someday we could be together. I would make a great dad. I would, I would always, you know, do the kind of things that your husband doesn't remember to do. Or doesn't think to do because he doesn't know you like I do. We could work together. We could launch the most amazing firm. We would kill it. We would, you know, crush all the competition. It, it would be amazing if we were doing life and we were doing business full time. That's the way it was meant to be. And um, and those those were the things that snuck into my ears. And it started to actually somehow make sense and I latched onto it like I was clutching a life raft and as far as love bombing and flattery like all of those things uh, hot cold push and pull like reinforcements um, yep. future faking grandiose statements can you elaborate on yeah. that sure so the way that these conversations would go is one moment he would be painting these beautiful pictures of how life could be if we were together, or he'd be saying sweet things like, I missed you today. I wish you were with me. Um, if, if you were here, everything would, would feel like life made sense. He would send me songs to listen to. He would, he would, he would talk about, um, wanting and, and needing me so much. And, and then the next minute he would go quiet. I wouldn't hear from him. Um, he'd go cold. I would reciprocate in some way. I would, I would say, I missed you too. And all of a sudden he would go cold and I wouldn't understand what that was all about. I wouldn't, I didn't, wouldn't know what I did wrong. Um, and sometimes when he would get into one of his downward cycles where he, where my, my narc ex was, was miserable and, and depressed and in a dark mood. Then he would go on a self-destructive spin and he would say terrible things about himself, waiting for me to rush in to correct him. Um, so the, there was a lot of, if, if, He was setting the tempo of our conversations. Sometimes he wanted to pull pull loving words out of me, and so he would he would ask me for confirmation. You know, do you think I'm do you think I'm attractive? Do you think I'm sexy? Do you think I'm smart? And of course, I would say, well, of course you are. And other times he would say, "Um, I think that you know you're wonderful, but you have to stop doing this or you do way too much of that. And then he, I, I noticed also that, that more and more of our texts were, tell me the details of what you're doing today. How are you doing this? Did you do that? You didn't do it the right way. This is how you need to do it. And at the end of a long, a long line of criticism, he would punctuate it with, um, well, you know, it's, it, it, it's nice that at least you have you're, you're cute, or you you have one little redeeming quality, and and that's why I love you. And you're lucky I put up with this. <laughs> so so there was a kind of 
I would get a little bit of what I was craving, that approval, and then he would take it back away. And he would insert a bunch of, you know, stuff that would make me feel bad again. So, so there, you know, during this beginning part where, you, you know, you're being devalued early on here, even in the love bombing and the trust building stage. You're getting these positive things that are going on and then these negative statements. Are you confused about it or are you like, this guy likes me or what, what are you feeling here? Like, do you think he likes you? What's going to going on? Or do you think he's like, this is who he is. This is what he does. I'll deal with it. Um, I think that I'm determined that I'm going to somehow figure this guy out. He doesn't make any sense to me. I've never been with someone who is, is so all over the place and this hot and cold and back and forth just, it doesn't make sense to me. It's outside of my experience, but I'm determined that there, I'm going to find a way to figure this puzzle out and I'm going to ride this roller coaster and I'm going to somehow take it to the destination that looks like the fairy tale <laughs> that, that, that I fell in love with for my life. This, this world where it was going to be, you know, the two sides of the same coin finally together and we were going to be able to, to do these amazing things was so attractive. And I thought, okay, I don't know what's going on right now. Sometimes I feel like you love me. Sometimes I feel like you hate me. Sometimes I feel like you think I'm garbage. But you always come back. You're, you're, never, you're never satisfied. You're always, you're always here. And I think that I'd never received the amount of attention that I was getting from him either. I think there were days when I would get 50, 60, maybe even 100 text messages a day from him. And, Sorry to um, interrupt you here, but um, I'm a little bit confused. And maybe uh, if I'm confused, maybe the audience might be confused. So I just want to clear uh, some stuff up. So... Like right now, I'm, I'm as a listener, I'm having a hard time understanding like why you like him, um, why you've bought into him. You know, I, I understand there there are some things there that he, he's yes he's he's saying these things to you, but as far as like the love stuff of like how he's kind of like he's doing this and he's doing this and it's bringing me in further and bringing me in further and bringing me in further. So you want to hear about the things I liked about him, the things that drew me in? Yeah, like it's because, you know, as far as storytelling goes, um, we, you know, we want to hear this is this is why I'm here. This is why I'm hooked. So when we're already hearing about the devaluation part, um, before we, uh, cause we're hearing about devaluation right now. And it, I think the confusing part for me is like, I don't even know that you're hooked right now. So, um, or like what has gotten you to like him to even, um, deal with the devaluation, uh, if that makes sense. Cause this, does this devaluation start right away? Yeah. And I think, um, it starts, I mean, I'm starting from a place of devaluation when, I didn't really think that he liked me at all. And I, in fact, he seemed to avoid me and I figured, well, he doesn't bother me to me because I'm not an elite designer like him. He does. Mm -hmm. He thinks he's too good for me. So when he started showing me attention, it was almost like, oh, wow. Like, you know, getting attention from somebody that you think is above your league, you know, out of your league. And, and he, you know, kind of felt, he always moves through the world as if everybody is kind of, out, he's sort of out of everybody's league. So that was kind of present from the beginning, To be, if I'm being honest. Um, what wasn't really present until I started getting hooked was was that, like, well, no, actually, it's a big secret, but I do like you, that type of thing. You know, and, and this is why it was so attractive to me is because, well, wow, I really thought I wasn't likable. <laughs> so... Uh, I respect it. I put him on a pedestal. He put himself on a pedestal. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, why is he talking to me? I'm flattered. I'm, um, I'm, I'm completely surprised that he's interested in me. And, and that there was enough of a hook for you to, you know, at that point, you're already in. 
Like that is they sealed the deal for you right there because you respected him so much. Yeah, I mean, I guess it sounds pitiful, but that is exactly okay. what got me. So you had him on a pedestal. He had you idealized as far as what, you know, his belief in you or his projection of what he wanted you to be. And he's, you know, so so you already know he's this grandiose type of person. And that's okay with you. Yeah, I think I knew... I. I I'm really good at worshiping at other people's pedestals, I guess, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't um, it wasn't hard for me to accept that he was this incredible, amazing, grandiose designer way above my league. I accepted that as fact pretty quickly. And then when he started showing me attention, I thought, oh, my gosh, why is he even bothering? Look, with a small little person like me, in my mind, I was, I was not... I was not a peer. And then when he started showing me attention and then he actually started to tell me that he thought I was a really great designer, that he he actually thought I was really, really special. It was like I thought I was dreaming. I thought, oh, my God, this person I've idolized is showing me attention. That's, That's crazy. Like, does that mean that I'm actually as good as he is? Like, that's impossible, is it? I I was completely flattered by his attention. I thought he was way out of my league. So everything from your childhood has led up to this point and is really controlling your whole entire belief system about who you are. Your whole worth, your self-worth has been put on trial the whole, your whole entire life. And here's now someone who's seeing your worthiness. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And and now you really feel like you are worth something. And this is really for some, someone you respected and that is massive for you. And then oh, all of a huge. sudden, without you even knowing, you're now taking your self-worth and putting it into someone else's hands. Is that fair to say? That's exactly fair to say okay. it's exactly what i what it's doing and it felt like such a relief it felt like somebody else had the steering wheel you know i was so afraid that i was going to drive my life and my self-worth like off the tracks because i just was so worried i was gonna not measure up in life and here's this guy that i just think the sun you know rises and sets with him i think he's amazing he's my i idolize him in a lot of ways and all of a sudden like he's saying i'm good enough to be tapped on the shoulder he wants to hitch his wagon to mine and that's just unbelievable and I'm so happy to hand him the keys to my life because I'm thinking wow it's in better hands now (laughs) so So, uh, you know at this point at this point you're cooked like very very early on you are cooked he has you and oh yeah from this point you know for everyone listening you, your marriage from here is going to really fall apart and you are going to, you know, eventually start a relationship with this person and, and he's devaluing you at the same time. Yeah. And so you're, and the- you're getting a push and pull, but you know, you're already, you're already into like you're already bought in. So this push and pull is just going to be part of your life. Yeah, I don't, I'm not surprised by it when it happens because, you know, I always remember he would say things to me that sounded so familiar because they were the very same things that I would say to myself. The the, the criticisms that, you know, would run in my head in the background that would tell, I would tell myself, you know, you're not good enough. You know, you're, you're, you're this, you're that, that there's such a negative self-talk that, I have always kind of had in the background. And when he would say those things, it would, it would be like, Oh, I feel seen, you know? I mean, it wasn't like he was insulting me. It was like, he knew the truth that I really wasn't good enough. And that was my big secret because I was having all this outside success. My design firm was flourishing. People were publishing my work. My star was supposedly rising, but inside I felt like such an imposter. And I knew everything that was imperfect about me, and so did he. And he would call it out. And not only would he call it out, but he would have a solution 
And so he would have a reason that he could fix it or that I needed him because I was so, you know. Okay, I, I get it now. You are in a spot here where you respect him so much and his opinion of because he can see you for what is actually going on that you are going to listen to everything and be like, yes, he's right. Yes, exactly. All right. All right. Now we're, now we're, I don't know I, what we're going to keep in here, but we're, I'm going to leave this in. Uh, everyone who's <laughs> listening, you know, we've been trying to figure, I've been trying to figure out what has been going on to like really hammer down, um, you know, really what's making you tick here. And, and this is really strong. Um, and you know, you're not just in here. You're really deep in. This is a really bad spot to be in. Um, you know, having your worth in someone's hands like this, where you truly believe that they have your best interest at heart or not just that, that they're so smart that I should just listen to them because I'm so tired of always trying to be perfect. I just want someone to do it for me. It's a real bad spot to be in. Yeah, yeah, and it wasn't, you know, it was like a foregone conclusion that I knew I was going to fail, and so to be able to trust somebody else with everything was such a relief, because I was figuring he's not going to be as likely to fail at my life as I would be. (laughs) You know how we talked before at the beginning where you said, you know, sometimes we have a conventional stories and how we do things in an unconventional? This is going to be one of those (laughs) unconventional ones, I think. (laughs) Well, you predicted uh, that's, it. That's, I figured you'd probably have to help me out here. <laughs> um, so, so for from this point, you um, you eventually sleep with him, and yeah. you know you're still married at the time. So, can you kind of discuss oh, yeah. you know what happened yeah. there? Obviously, guilt, um, huge guilt, and STDs. Yeah, I I mean I was so ashamed that I had fallen so far as to have a physical affair that I'd never thought I was capable of doing um, just with my morality, you know, and my perfection attempt at life. I just thought this was impossible for me, and yet here I was. And then the secondary effect was I get an STD, and I'm so ashamed and so horrified. I can't even conceive of being able to show that shame to my husband. So I, you know, we end it, and I don't ever tell him the deep dark secret of my shame how de- how deep it goes and um and i also just feel so worthless i feel so disgusting on every level so it's um and now you know there's there's no second relationship so i'm expecting my my narc to to, to sail in and to take charge and to fix everything because he seemed so interested in doing just that right up until he had the opportunity <laughs> to actually sail in and do anything. And um, and then he, of course, he, he pulls back and he's like, oh, oh, now you're available. Oh, now you're all alone and now you need me. Um, maybe I'm going to pull back and I, I'm, I'm too busy and I can't come there. And, I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm backing away. And um, and so. And so that begins the next chapter, and the, the next chapter is really one where um, we're working alongside each other in the firm that I've created. He's a full-time employee, but he's not giving me what I'm wanting, which is a relationship. I've, I've lost my marriage. I've lost my self-respect in a lot of ways in the process, and I'm thinking, I don't understand. I fell in love with this image of the life we were going to have together. Where are you? You're working with me, but you're working from states away, hours away. You're not with me. You're not in my life. We're doing this long distance, and this is going on for, you know, uh, I think it was about two years. And I'm just, I'm taking this to mean that I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not good enough for him to really pick for his partner in all ways after all. And, um... I'm just trying to change his mind. I'm, I'm trying to make him happy. I'm trying to everything. And I'm hating myself more in the process. His, his, um, 
his his love bombing has has gone way down. His uh, criticism has gone way up, and so I'm getting such constant feedback on all of my problems, my supposed weaknesses, the daily things I'm doing wrong with the business in his mind or doing wrong personally. He's telling me, you know, you should dress different. You should you, you shouldn't look the way you do. You shouldn't work the way you do. And even though I would call myself a feminist, even though I'm well educated, I just have such low self worth that I believe him. And I believe that he's saying this as he would put it, because he wants to help. <laughs> and yeah, I'm sinking and I'm sinking and I'm sinking. And the low point comes when his his sneaking around and his shady behavior that I've, I've picked up on along the way. Uh, the phone was always face down on the table. He was always missing. He was always not there. And my suspicions, are, you know, get higher. I'm checking his phone. I'm feeling crappy about doing that. But I'm doing it because I don't trust him. Something in my gut is telling me this is something's not right. Even though I believe everything he says to be true about me and about everything. I feel unsettled. And that's when I discover that I'm not alone. Um, and my narc, who I thought was my, you know, knight in char- shining armor, was actually involved in not just my relationship with him, which I thought was the only one he was having, but he's also actively married. His wife doesn't realize that their marriage is over. And um, he's also carrying on multiple other relationships as well. Um, He's got a full-time relationship with a a colleague and friend of mine that's been going on even longer than I've been in his life. Years and years. And his, uh, apparently, his role in her, the end of her marriage was very similar story to mine. As well as many other casual partners. So this guy has been juggling many women. Three very full-time women myself, my friend, and his wife. And then he's also got, you know, girls at bars and that he meets and whatever. And this just blows my world apart. So it blows your world apart. that's the end of chapter one. (laughs) Okay, that's the end of chapter one. So it blows your world apart, and he's still working for you. Um, How does everything, what happens from here? Yeah, so he's working for me. He's completely entrenched in in my fledgling company. And um, he's in control of a lot of the projects that we're working on. My clients have relationships with him. There's a lot of professional and legal entanglements that make this explosion in my personal life, this devastating blow, something that I have to try to compartmentalize because I'm terrified that if I blow up my professional life by removing him, I'm... I feel like I'm in a catch-22. I feel like I'm damned if I do. I'm damned if I don't. What do I do? I'm trapped. I feel so trapped. And it it, it's, it kills me in retrospect to, to think of myself here because I just want to go back in time and, and shake myself. <laughs> I wish I had known then what I know now. This is all new to me. I don't have a word for narcissism. I don't know anything about this type of abuse. I have no idea what's happened to me. And I'm so in the thick of it. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm bound by responsibilities here. I'm in, I revert to my training of being the helper, being the, you know, cheerleader, the person who takes care of everybody. And now I'm more worried. I choose to be more worried about everybody else. My, my fellow, the other employees around in, in the company, now there's, you know, five of us or so. Everybody's going to be affected if I remove this guy. Um, I'm thinking about my clients. My clients are really going to be suffering if I remove this guy. Thinking about, you know, the legal implications. My business could be in trouble. And I'm also responsible um, for people's, you know, w- livelihoods. So I'm, f- I'm feeling like I don't know how I can extricate him. He's so essential Without him, I still fully believe that my, my business will fail and everybody who depends on it and they're feeding their families from it will, will fail with me. And I feel like I, I can't do that. I can't do that to them. 
And I'm also thinking about my friend, my friend who does, still doesn't know that she's in a relationship with this person. And I'm thinking about his wife who, you know, doesn't know what he's up to, too. And I'm worrying about them. My reaction to all this is to just sink myself into a puddle of worrying about everybody else. And, and so, um, he convinces me, he, he decides, you know, once the, once the jig is up and the curtain's been pulled back and he's been found out, um, he starts to bargain with me and he starts to, um, he's decided that his position in the company is very important to him. He wants to maintain that. So he, he manipulates my view of this situation and he says, you know, we can work together. We can make this work. I'm not going to abandon your clients. I'm not going to abandon your business. I'm not going to watch it fail. Highlighting, of course, that he believes that that's what will exactly happen if he's not a part of it. And then he also plays upon my guilt, you know, my, my readiness to accept guilt by saying, really, you know, I feel terrible about this. I feel terrible about hurting you. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so, so sorry. I'll never do something like this again. And I've ended it with um, my, you know, other girlfriend who's a friend of mine as well. I've ended it with her. I promise I'll never bother her again. She doesn't need to go through the pain of hearing all the details. Please don't tell her. She's had so many struggles. She couldn't handle it. And then he goes on and says similar things about his wife. I, I promise that I won't do anything like this again. Please let me make it right. Please let please, please protect the people that don't deserve to have the pain put upon them of, of you know knowing what you know. I'm going to do right by this situation if you'll just give me the chance. And so I choose to trust him and I choose to hope that by keeping the secret of what's happened and by um, protecting, you know, everybody else uh, from the truth, so to speak, I feel I, I, I allow myself to be convinced that I'm doing the right thing. And so that's what I do. I keep my silence and we work together. And um, every single day, I feel like it kills me that this is the situation I'm in. He's really good. Yeah. Yeah, he is. And, you know, uh, my friend is also still working with me. And so I'm confronted by all sorts of reminders on a daily basis of this pain. But I feel like I'm in a little corner of forced silence. And um, I've trapped myself there. I've he, allowed he, myself he to He hit there. you in all of your spots. And he knew, exa- oh, yeah. and he knew exactly... <laughs> <laughs> Where to go? I mean, yeah, he's really good. He was, he was really, really smooth, good. real, real smooth. He got you. He is. That was like for him, that was nothing. He had you. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, so you know, it's it's in this dark period when I'm incredibly now. I'm learning the word depression. I'm I'm myself in the first uh, you know the first long dark valley of depression myself. And I'm working incredibly long hours, and I'm devoting myself to keeping the business, you know, going. He's in it. I'm still trying to juggle all of this and make sense of it. And in walks, you know, NARC 2. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this except to say that the second narcissist walks into my life at this moment when I feel like my self-worth is in the gutter, and I feel so alone, and nobody can know the the load that I'm carrying because I'm trying to protect everybody else. So, and, so um, essentially just to explain to people right here, you're broken up with narcissist. Number one, a new guy yeah. comes into your life. You start dating him and you're dating him. Uh, you know, you're already at a real low. You're dealing with this other stuff on a day to day basis. You're feeling terrible about everything. And now here comes this other guy into your life, which is just going to make your life a little bit worse for about a year. Yeah. And, you know, he hooks me the same way. I guess, you know, he figures out my number two and he, um, I, I start out I find him the same way. It's a professional conference we meet, and I'm looking up to him again. You know, he's like NARC 1. NARC 2 is also 10 years older, further along in his career. He's the, you know, splashy uh, designer guy that everybody respects and I think is way outside my league. 
and he turns his attention towards me unexpectedly, and I'm like, what is this? Maybe he wants to be a mentor. Maybe he wants to be a friend. That's so cool. I can't believe he's, you know, tapping me on the shoulder. That's crazy. It's exactly the same um, uh, theme, but this guy presents in a completely different way. His personality is different. He he doesn't have the combative kind of beat you down, make you feel bad about yourself technique. He has the um, seductive, uh, you know, uh, lovely, lovely language, really sexy, really, um, he spins, he spins this softer tail that, you know, still putting me up on that pedestal with him. Oh my God, you're amazing. You're, you're a fantasy version of yourself, but he's, he's just dressed in different clothing and it feels so different that I'm thinking for sure this time, this time, this one is different. <laughs> But, and he and he but was he, he, but he, he was uh, he was not and yeah. after a year you break up and uh, you know now you're you find yourself back uh, eventually into a relationship again with narcissist number 1 so how did that happen yeah so um and i guess narcissist- during i guess during that time did narcissist number 1 ever make comments about the current guy you were dating to try and get oh, you back yeah. okay yeah he you know he started playing the same game that um he did when i was married you know whatever guy in my life he's definitely not good enough so he's going to make snide comments about the guy that's in my life even though he doesn't have the right to say anything and i'll tell him so the fact that we're working together every day He'll still t- sneak in those those pot shots that, you know, my relationship, just the fact that I have one, and he just can't stand it, and he has to take digs at the other guy. Um, he even reaches out to try to sabotage the relationship, reaching out to, to my, the new guy and saying, you know, you shouldn't want to be with her. She's she's no good. Just doing anything he can. He's desperate to, to sabotage it. But eventually the, the, the relationship ends uh, for other reasons, and I feel discarded, and I am out in nowhere land. The Narc 2 is tired of me. The fantasy is over. I've outlived my usefulness to him. And so, just like that, I'm gone. I've, I'm out, uh, kicked out of the kingdom, and I feel so rejected, and I feel even worse than I did at the, be- the end of my relationship with Narc 1. I'm thinking, oh my god. Twice now I've been thinking this was the saving of my life. This person was extending their hand and I was going to be good enough finally. And twice now I've been, you know, felt the opposite. I felt completely gutted at the end of these relationships. So I'm in that miserable state when Narc One starts singing his song again. He sees the end of that second relationship. Finally, competition's out of the way. He sails back in. He said, you know, I'm still working with him every day. And he's saying, oh, my God, you know, I've changed so much since years ago when we were together. I made so many mistakes that I would never repeat. If you give me another chance, I'll do anything differently. I'll, I'll, it will be so different this time. And he promises, promises, promises. And I am so desperate for that story to be true that I give him the chance and we resume a relationship. And, um, and this is at the, at this point in time, this is when he feels the most powerful. He just got me again. And now he's fully it back in the driver's seat. He doesn't just have control over my business life, um, through his, you know, uh, his, his way of making himself the center of everything. He's already recruited all the employees that work for me. He's already created a bunch of little flying monkeys, as people call them, people that are big fans of his. He, they think he's the funniest. They think he's the smartest. They think he's the best. And he's he's developing these relationships, and he's always digging at me in the process. So he's driving a wedge between myself and my staff and, um, and under, basically undermining my reputation uh, as much as he can so that his place as the superior person person in my own business can be untested uncontested so he's firmly firmly in control of your personal life and your professional life here yeah absolutely is your self-esteem at its worst ever right here at this point yep 
I remember breaking down into tears in my office. And at one point in time, I turned to my office manager, who at that point had started, was pretty much there from the beginning with me. She'd been working with me at that time for about five, six years. And I turned to her, to her and I said, you know, would this place be better off if I just stepped away? Like, would, would it be better off without me? And I really meant it. I really meant it. I, I was asking the question because I believed that it must be true. And I was trying to do what was right for everybody. And I was trying to be brave enough to, to ask that question, suspecting that the answer was yes, that we'd be better off if you would step away. And um, that was the low point. Definitely. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, as far as friends or, or close uh, people you are close to in any sort of way, are you able to discuss what's going on with them or are you too afraid to? You know, one of the things that I remember is that every time someone would overhear a conversation on the phone with my, between myself and my narc, um, they would say things, whether they were a stranger or whether they're someone that knew me well, like a friend, part of my family, they would say, who are you talking to? And it would just blow their mind. If they even heard a fragment of the conversation, they would say, what? Because they saw my demeanor completely change, I think, from what they knew to a different version of me. I guess a very different um, energy from me. Uh, and and uh, I guess it was just so far outside of that what they understood. And they would hear snippets of his end of the conversation and it's, it'd say, what, who is that? Why do you even talk to that person? And I would say, well, he's, you know, he, he's, he's my lead designer or whatever. And I would make excuses and I would try to play it down because they were so incredulous that, that at the way I was being spoken to, they couldn't understand why would you put up with that? And so I was too ashamed to admit not only did I put up with it, but I believed it. And I thought that actually he's the only person that really knew me, that really knew the real me. That He was actually the one who understood me. And so I didn't share a lot with my family and my friends. I was I was editing my, my life because I think um, it was too painful to show them that side of things and admitting the full story would mean answering the question of why you put up with it. And I think in my mind, the answer was because I, I, I need him and I, and he's right. And I, I'm dependent. If, if it wasn't for him, I would be a mess. I, I would literally already have failed. Um, and you guys just don't know it because you don't see behind the scenes. You don't really know me and you don't know how big a failure I am. So your catch-22 was the problem is the solution, and the solution is the problem. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so, you know, my I definitely experienced a shrinking world because my relationships with my family and friends were affected, I think. When you stop sharing with people, they, still, they stop feeling as close to you, and they don't know how to support you and how to feel like they want to um, in your life. And... Um, and so he became everything for me. You know, he was the only person that really knew this enormous part of my life because I wasn't sharing it with anyone else. And it, what, do, you, do you feel that the only person that could fix your pain was him? Um, I felt like he was not interested in fixing my pain. I felt like I, it was my responsibility to fix all the things wrong with me, and then my pain would end. My pain would be over when I stopped failing so much. And, of course, that was defined by how much he thought I was failing. So he was in control of that. You were really turned in all directions. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's tough. And That's really tough to navigate. Like, um, you know, obviously you, you get out of here and, and out of the situation, but... You know, to navigate those waters and, and how turned around you were and all the confusion, um, your worth not being in your hands and how much control this person had, uh, not a really, not a good spot to be in. 
and you, you know you got out and you should be proud of yourself i'm i'm getting ahead of myself but you know uh, you know you were really in you got really entrenched in there and um you know it just you should be proud you're saying no oh, thanks yeah it was i i really bought into it because it was perfectly tailored to like you said he found he found all of those buttons to push that um that I left, I left those doors wide open, you know, those paths to, to capitalize on those, those vulnerabilities. And yeah, if you ever read the human, right yeah, sorry. If you ever read the human, human maggots, human maggot, if you, <laughs> if I think you, I lived that. <laughs> if, if you ever read the human magnet syndrome, you two, you two together, you guys were the perfect magnet match. Exactly. And I think you just hit on the things that I've been thinking about the most recently. So I want to get back to that magnet thing at the end, if you remind me. Okay. <laughs> so just to catch you up with the, the end of the second chapter is, um, uh, you know, two more years of this and my self-worth just keeps getting beaten every week. Um, and um, this catches us up to basically the second um, f- finding out uh, that, you know, behind the curtain, it, it, the, 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 the promises that were made, the future that he promised was, was empty because he was still up to his own old tricks. He was still doing all the things that he was doing the first time, the, the cheating, the lying, everything was repeating itself. The cycle had started up again and it actually, you know, it had never ended. I had fooled myself into thinking that he was capable of change, but he had never changed. So the relationships with his wife have still never ended. The relationship with his um, with his girlfriend slash my friend had never ended. And this was all possible because he's still living out of state at this time. He's coming in to see me a week or two at a time, then he's flying back home. So he can do what he wants over there and he can tell me, whatever he wants to tell me about where he is and I'm taking him at his word. And at, at one point, you know, what was really happening is I was flying in to see him from time to time and I'd fly out and my friend, the other girlfriend would show up the, the following week. And, you know, I remember her telling me later that, um, when I, I, I put up a Christmas tree in his house, um, just before Christmas that last year, I actually purchased it and ordered it and all the stuff and put it up by myself. He didn't help me at all. I did the whole thing. And this was my big surprise because I wanted to help him make his house feel more like home. You know, he had a way of kind of pulling these favors out of you. Oh, you know, my house doesn't feel homely like yours does. And if only I had decorations, he would always just throw these little fishing lines out, manipulative kind of needs that said, oh, look over here, I have a need that you can fix for me. And then I would rush at the suggestion. It wouldn't take much suggestion. I would just think I was being thoughtful, generous, and I'd just rush to do it. So there I am, putting the tree together, making it beautiful. And uh, the very next week, you know, his girlfriend's visiting, and he's telling the girlfriend how hard he worked putting up this Christmas tree. And, of course, that's a complete lie because he never touched it. But it was just a, a really kind of crystallized example to me of the absurd reality I was living in. I was literally living in like a lifetime bad movie, you know, where you're like, how could she ever not realize that the man she's married to is married, married to two other women. That's the kind of life I was living. And I had no idea because I allowed myself to believe what he told me. And I, um, as much as I complained about him not being a full-time presence in my life, I just always fell for the reasons he gave me. You know, I can't sell my house. I've, you know, we're, we're doing this long distance. We said, we, we, you know, all these reasons. And, uh, and so that's how we pulled it off. So I finally find out it's never changed. I'm still in this tr- triangle, crazy star. You know, I don't know how many points of this triangle there are because there's lots of people in his life. He's, he's desperate for attention and no one woman is ever, you know, going to give him enough. And when I find this out, I'm, I'm just, it blows my mind again. I, I thought my mind was already blown. It's blown even more. But this time is different. This time, unlike the first time, I'm not going to fall for his story about how I'm protecting people by being quiet. 
and um, sparing them from the pain that I had to go through the first time by realizing the depths of his deception. This time I realized the only way that I'm going to help anybody is by making sure that they know exactly what kind of a life they're living. And so um, I'm, I, take, I take a moment and I'm still, you know, very entrenched with this person in business. So any move I make is going to cost me dearly no matter what. I'm going to, it's going to cost me financially. It's going to cost me in terms of political capital with my clients and my coworkers and everything. But I now know there's nothing that's going to stop me from getting out from under this. This is too much even for me with no self-esteem. I'm thinking, nope, there's this one little shred in there that's still battling for myself. And I know that something has to be done. So so I take a moment, I figure out my plan, and I decide that there's a. it's about a week or two weeks that it's coming up we're going to have this business trip together. And it's my, it's my chance. He's going to be outside of my office. He's going to be away from my people. He's also not going to be in my house where I don't feel safe because there's been some times when – he hasn't been outright physically abusive and hit me, but he's been threatening and he's been out of control. And I just don't want him in my house. I'm not feeling safe to, to unmask him the second time without being safe. So I find my moment. We're on a business trip out of town, and I decide that I'm going to let my friend know what's going on. So I... I use a tape recorder on my cell phone and I do this because I want to have a conversation with him where he acknowledges the timeline of our relationship. And I want to record us talking in the car as we're driving to this, you know, this uh, business destination, because if I don't record this, I feel like nobody's going to believe me. Nobody else in his life, nobody else that's been on the receiving end of his manipulations and his lies is ever going to believe anything I would say. He'll have an excuse. He'll tell them I'm crazy. He'll he'll tell them I'm lying, whatever. I, I know how he works, and I know how convincing he is. So I'm saying to myself, I'm recording this. And so we do. I take him. I We have a, a discussion in the car where I'm telling him a lot of things that bother me about our relationship, and I'm going backwards in time, and I'm, I'm, I'm basically entrapping him into admitting the truth of our of our relationship and all the years and all the things that have gone on, at least on a high level. And I end the conversation, I save the recording, and I email it to my friend. And I do this knowing that we can confront him together in a safe space. She's going to be, you know, available and, and processing this information at the same time that um, – that I'm out from my normal environment. He's away from our normal environment and I feel safe enough to kind of wave a red flag in front of the bull because I know that there's going to be a lot of anger that comes from him when I do this. And, um, and so I send the recording, my friend listens to it. She calls me the next morning. You know, we don't say much to each other. I think she's still reeling because she is invested. I think I'm five years in at this time. She's seven years in. She's got a small child. She's She's got a lot to, to process in that moment. But I asked her, do you want to say anything to him? She said yes. So um, I call her on the phone without him realizing it. I walk in to um, uh, the hotel lobby where, where we're st- both staying. And again, I'm choosing my moment. I want it to be in a public place where I feel safe. And um, I said, you know, on the phone. And she knows everything now. And she has something to say. And she, sorry, I know I mentioned her name. You'll have to take that out. But um, she says, hello. She pretty much only manages hello. And he runs out of the room. He's just, he can't, he can't even be, I was shocked that he just ran away like a little kid. He just ran. And at that point, I left the hotel and I drove to 
his wife's house. Um, we were actually, the business trip happened to be located in the same city that she lives. And I knew where she lived and, and, um, I knew that I would be able to reach her before he did. And I, I slipped a little note through her mail slot. She's never met me, but I felt compelled to apologize to her and to confess that I'd been complicit in this uh, massive deception of years and um, to let her know that I was so sorry that I didn't realize the truth of their relationship and that there were others. And, um, and I shared with her, as I shared with my friends that, you know, physically speaking, he had, he'd given me, um, an illness and, and that I wanted them to be able to know that this is possible for them too. And, and so in that moment, in that big dramatic arc of the day, I was blowing up a couple people's lives and I felt tremendous responsibility and guilt and I also felt uh, like it was the only and necessary thing to do because there was this runaway train and he was running people over and nobody nobody knew it and um, I needed to shine a light on it so that all of us could hopefully move forward someday um, and that was the end of the um, the relationship with him and did you ever speak to the wife or did she ever get into contact with you? Um, she, did, she did not. And um, I'm sure she has her reasons and, I, and that's okay. I know she received the message and I know um, at least she knows the truth of what went on from at least my perspective. So at that point, you never see him again and you fire him from your company? Uh, so he... I never, I, I never get that clean of a break professionally. Um, I'm trying to keep things out of the office and while I'm also trying to extricate him from my business life. I think I made the decision in that moment that I first needed to clean up my personal life and make sure the other women that were involved knew what they were involved in. And then I would just pick up the pieces of whatever happened with the professional life. I was surprised that he didn't immediately evaporate from my work life as well. I thought that he would probably just disappear or he would, you know, launch an incredibly vicious campaign. I think I think he chose the path that he looked at his options and he chose the path that he wanted to continue the professional relationship from afar and I was trying to do it. I was trying to remove him in the least painful way possible from my professional life. So I was backing away slowly. So I sort of would describe it as a slow um, ramping down of his position until eventually he was gone. But it took months where we were still working together professionally. So I guess I had gotten so compartmentalized. I had practiced that for years. And the fact that I had just suffered a second personal devastation still didn't take away my ability to have this dual life where I was pretending that I wasn't bleeding on the over here and I was trying to put a good face on over there. Um, so it took a few more, you know, a good, probably a good six months to get him out of my professional life. And did you go to a, like a professional to discuss how to do the unwinding? Or did you figure it out by yourself? I figured that part out by myself, but I did start therapy. Um, and I've been seeing a therapist every week. And um, I'm lucky to be in the position to do that. But the logistics of getting him out of my work life were something that I navigated on my own. Um, I think what she was trying to help me with and still does help me with is trying to get him out of my head. Because his voice was so enmeshed with my own self-critical voice and still is. I still hear his voice, even though I haven't physically spoken to him in almost, you know, nine months. I still hear it all the time, every day, because it says the same things that I want to say to myself about myself. I have to keep catching myself when I do it. So she's helping me with that, and I'm making progress with that now. And, um, you know trying to live a more sober life uh, from his attention and his reinforcement.
And when it comes to, you know, getting him out of your life completely, has he completely left your life Is he, or does he still try and get a hold of you? Yeah. So um, last November, I formally asked him to stop contacting me um, and he's ignored it ever since. Um, I've, I've asked um, my attorney to write letters. I've at times you know, had to file for restraining orders, things like that. But the, the contact request, uh, the, the attempts at contact have honestly never stopped. I just received a piece of mail from him last week. So despite nine, nine months of zero um, response, except through an attorney, um, twice he's received attention twice through my attorney when necessary but other than that no response whatsoever from me but he would call on an unknown number so even if I blocked his number in my cell phone he'd call on the unknown blocked number he would leave sometimes he would call you know in the first few months of no contact he would call sometimes 12 15 times a day or all night and leave you know rambling apology messages he would talk to me about how, again, how miserably sorry he was, how much of a fool he was, um, how he would never make the mistake, same mistakes again. He was, he has still done all of the same things that he always has done in an attempt to reel me back in. And, um, you know, he's even resuscitated the love bombing again and started with the compliments again that were so rare when we were actually in a relationship, so to speak. That was when I got less of them. But, you know, when I would walk away from him and, uh, d and you know, reclaim myself, he, all of a sudden my value would go back up, you know. And I, r I really believe that he only wants what he can't have, you know. So I don't know that he'll ever stop trying to reach out. So how long has it been since you've gone completely no contact? Uh, so it's been since November 14th and of last year. do you still struggle with wanting to contact him? And uh, if so, uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, that's a really important question. And I'm glad you asked because in some ways I'm freer than I've ever been. You know, my life is more peaceful. I don't have that constant negative uh, voice in my head physically the way on the phone from him. I still deal with my own version of that, but he's no longer a presence. But I, I definitely notice my brain still reaching back for the familiar and he did ingrain himself so much into my life in every area of my life, my personal life, my professional life, that um, there is that trauma bond that people talk about. And um, it's definitely real for me. I know that um, it's it was such a strong um, drug to me in a lot of ways, this constant need to try to please him, to try to find the way to, to, to get it right this time. And um, he, he, he just felt, he really enmeshed him, his life with mine. He, he want, I've heard people talk about how narcissists kind of want to just absorb your personality and your spirit and become one with you in a way and co-opt your, your personality. And that's the way it felt. And it felt so like he was so close and in there way down, dug down, down really deep. He just dug, dug, dug. I, f I feel like I still reach for that sometimes, even though I haven't, I haven't responded and I've stayed um, away from him. It has taken a lot of effort and there've been so many times when I've been tempted. So many times when I've heard that voicemail that says all the right things, or I've read that card um, that I shouldn't have read. I should have just burned it when I received it, but I read it anyway, and there's that's the addict in me that still craves this poisonous drug of the impossible, you know, the the impossible reach for me is, is pleasing somebody that can't be pleased. And that's the thing that keeps gnawing at me sometimes when I'm having a, a weak moment. And um, I think, honestly, that as I said to you when I wrote in, 
listening to, to, to podcasts like this that you guys produce has really helped me in those moments. I'll, I'll throw a podcast on like yours or I'll um, listen to um, other voices on this narcissism issue and I educate myself. I really dug into learning. That was my recovery strategy was I want to learn everything there is to know about what happened to me because I'd never even heard of this when it happened. And, um, and so th- that's the strategy. But, yes, to answer your question, every single day it's still a battle, even though it's 280-something days later. And I would have expected that it would have just gotten easier and easier and easier in a straight, nice, even line. But <laughs> it has not been like that for me. And so that is something that I think is um, probably going to be like a, a, like any other addiction, something that you kind of always have to be on guard for because I don't know if I'll ever be completely immune to those kinds of things. And when it comes to your self-worth and, you know, your perfection, perfectionism and fear of failure uh, with your therapist, how are you working on those things? So if you find another person like this last two guys you have met that you don't fall into the same trap. Yeah. Um, so this is where that tie back to that magnetism comes in. I think the more that I learn about narcissism and the pathology of it and, you know, how, the dynamics work, the more I realize my energy that I was bringing into my life from my, you know, upbringing and my personality, whatever you want to say about how people become the way they are, I'm, I've got the same kind of energy imbalance in in the opposite way that maybe my narc has in the sense that um, both of us are looking to other people to kind of validate ourselves and for me I was looking to other people I wanted to please them I wanted to um, look for their approval all the time and I had a really artificially low self-worth for him he had an artificially high self-worth and he was looking for people to help him make sure that that fantasy reality was true so he needed to dominate other people he needed to control other people in order to you know, make, make his world make sense. And so it was like a big old magnet pulling us together. And, um, if I change my energy, if I find a way to heal that imbalance where I'm looking at other people all the time and, um, get more centered in how I feel about myself, then I'm not going to make as much of a magnet pull towards me for the people that would seek to dominate me and want to steal that lightning, you know, to make it their own, to co-opt it and to say, oh, I just, you know, conquered a, um, I've got a lightning bug in a jar, you know, I don't want to be the lightning bug in somebody's jar again. So I got to change the way that I'm operating so that I don't do that. So I have a question for you. Yeah. And... I guess in the last few months, four months, I've started to, at least in some of my emails back to people, say to them, you know, because not people are listening, not every episode we record make it to air. We record a lot of episodes and a lot of them don't make it to air. Right, some of them go to our Patreon, some of them never even go anywhere. And, you know, what I have started to say to some people is if you think that if the show doesn't make it to the main show, the main podcast, that you'll be so upset about it that it'll throw you backwards into whatever stage of healing you're in, then let's not even start the recording process at all. So for you to come on here and sit here with me today and, you know, record and keep your self-worth on your side of the fence. How are you feeling about that? That, you know, did that kind of come into any sort of your mind about like, oh, I don't want to be rejected or anything like that? Because it's, reje- <laughs> it's not rejection because, you know, we have a job to kind of to do here as far as like uh, 
having our audience listen the whole entire way through. We have to put on the most, um, the easiest, not the easiest to listen to. It's hard to explain, but uh, not entertaining, but ones where people will just listen the whole way. So did that make you nervous? Yeah, I think um, for sure that it it does make you nervous because at least for myself, I don't feel like I know the uh, things that other people are necessarily needing to hear what they're looking for and whether or not I'll be able to offer it. And you want to be helpful. That's my nature, right? I want to be helpful. I want to give people what they want, but you don't really know what sh- what they want. It was um, it was nerve wracking, and certainly when I would stumble and get lost somewhere, um, yeah, it would it would be hard to to feel like, oh God, there's me failing at, at my job, right, for the next ninety minutes. But um, I think my recovery is about pushing through the fear of failure, and so. Even if I'm starting to feel that panic of being rejected or not doing something right, I think that's exactly what I need to be doing is putting myself in places where I don't feel comfortable, but I still do it anyway. And and those are really powerful healing opportunities. Um, I, I know we've all gone through COVID and we've all, you know, done a lot of um, hard things during that time. Coming out of it, I challenged myself to mark the end of, you know, the maybe social distancing extremes by saying, okay, I'm going to do something on a bucket list that that scares me, but I'm going to do it anyway because I am afraid of failing, but I'm also afraid of not trying and let me do it so that I can come out the other side and conquer that fear. I did that with scuba diving. I felt completely out of my element. I was sure that I was going to drown. And then, you know, pushing through that fear got me the most beautiful otherworldly experience and so doing something like this where I feel like I'm out of my element and I'm not doing what I do for a living I'm not feeling confident that facing the fear um, is probably the best strategy for me going forward so I can try to change that energy and not be a magnet for, for being a people pleaser forever can I tell you something Please do. This is one of my favorite episodes that I've ever done. What? (laughs) No, sir. I thought for sure I was one of your worst. (laughs) It has nothing to do with that. You know, we both came here. It's hard to explain, but I think you brought the best out of me today. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you. And likewise, I think I could say the same. There was a moment where things kind of clicked and I felt safe and I felt like we were speaking the same language. So thank uh, you for that. There is this, uh, I'm I'm just going to be really blunt here. There is this uh, documentary that I love called Dogtown uh, Dogtown and Z-Boys. It's about a skateboard team. And there's this one moment in there where this man from who was running this skate team at the time was talking about uh, a one of the skaters, and he said, "You know, there's a, when you watched him skate, he, this person would you know be in the middle of a move, and it would be an absolute disaster. And somehow <laughs> through that disaster, he, this person made art." And for some reason, I feel like that today. That's our show. <laughs> well, I like that. I will. I, I will take that as a huge. D- d- does that make sense? And I'm so happy that we made. I, I, yes! th- I think we I were in like a we in, in like a, a trouble spot for a while, and then we just <laughs> hit it. Awesome. Don't you think so? <laughs> well, yes, I would definitely say I feel so, and I'm so happy you feel so as well. All right. So, you know, before we end off our show today, do you have any words of wisdom or advice for everyone, advice for everyone else uh, who's going through the same thing? Yeah, um, I do. I think making sense of what's happened is, is really important. And for me, it's been a strategy of listening to other people's stories, finding the commonality, which your show does a beautiful job of, of sharing with the world. It's also been like, you know, peeling back some of the psychology, digging into my own past and figuring out what was going on with me so that I could put it all into context and really reverse engineer my thinking. Um, and so 
and and then once I once I work through all the understanding parts, my brain I, I hit a little bit of a plateau because my brain felt like it had all the information that it could have, and it still I just still felt stuck. I still felt like I was in the grieving stage for so much longer than I wanted to be, and I didn't know how to move forward from that. I thought I I had all the facts, but I still felt so sad and so empty. And I think that for me, this next chapter of healing is going to, is really centering around the emotional changes that come from putting myself out of my comfort zone and teaching myself that I can trust myself again, because I adopted someone else's version of reality as my truth. That was how my abuse was made possible. And in order to silence his voice in my head, which as I said, I still hear from time to time, I have to make my own voice much louder than it has ever been inside of me. And so for me, that means pushing myself, challenging myself, patting myself on the back for my wins, recognizing those wins and really, um, having room in my life for, for the joy of, of those everyday victories, the ones that say, oh my gosh, it feels really good to just sit in the sun and, and to not be productive or helping anybody else right now. Just, just to be enjoying living, just, just living, just being here is enough. And I've already done what I needed to do just by showing up. Um, so if anybody else can identify with that, I would just say, um, keep doing what you can do to, to move through the stages of grief so you can get to the other side of where the, I think the peace is waiting. And, um, I know that everybody can do it because I know that nobody (laughs) thought they would fail more than me. And here I am. And I'm feeling so much better than I did. So keep walking. Well, Kaya, I am proud of you. You've come a long way. Uh, you know, you're going through a lot. You've been through a lot. You're doing the work, and it's not easy to do. You have a lot of work to do, but you're on your way. Uh, you know, what you went through, you were in a really, as I said earlier, you were in a really bad spot, and you found yourself here, and you're helping a lot of people today. And you should be really proud of yourself. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here with me. Thanks. Um, I don't know if it matters, but you called me Kaya and you called me Op- just then and you called me Opal in the beginning. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Kaya was the person that I spoke to two hours ago. <laughs> That's Did I call you Kaya moment. earlier as well? Uh, no, you called me Opal in the beginning, and then you called me Kaya just then. Okay, I'll make sure. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> okay. I can't believe I did that, but now I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to get my composure. <laughs> Hold on. Whew. Well, Opal... Hold on. <laughs> Maybe I need a new name. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think we should just end the show there. So from Opal and not Kaya and I, does that even make sense? We hope you have a good night.